Adversity makes you smarter. Adversity makes you a better leader. It's probably the most important thing because we're going into some very, very adverse times. I do this because it's proof I said it, if you know what I mean. Because everybody now is a prophet. The biggest stock market crash in history is still coming. And I said, I'm going to change the title to, it's here. This is the biggest crash we'll ever, ever see in our lifetimes. It's called the everything bubble. Everything's going to come down. And that's how you can prepare for it. So for most people, that's bad news. But as I was saying last night, crashes, everything goes on sale. And you can't get rich at that time. You know, like right now I'm in Hogs Heaven because Saks is always having sales. I'm in there shopping. But the most important thing this country and the world needs, as you know, Europe's in trouble. They don't think the EU is going to make it. China's in trouble. Japan's in serious trouble. The world's in trouble. It's in trouble because of lack of leadership. And as President John Kennedy said, leadership and learning go hand in hand, basically. I'm here to serve those who serve. We need more leaders, ladies and gentlemen, but this country sorely lacks leaders. I'm not Republican or Democrat, but I just can't believe what's going on in our government. I mean, how can they open the borders? How can they cut off the Keystone XL pipeline? How can this guy blame Russia, President blame Ukraine and Russia for our problems? We have food shortages. Sri Lanka, which is the richest island nations in the world, is in rioting right now. So we need leaders. This is a time for you to become bigger leaders because I think people are kind of waking up that maybe it's our leadership that's a problem. There's a guy named Jordan Peterson who said, um, if you think tough men are bad, just see the damage a weak leader can do. We've had weak leaders all over the world right now. So how bad do you think market crash is going to be? How bad, how ugly can it get? The worst case, which I hope I'm wrong, be civil war inside America. That's more than a crash, it's a civil war. We need new leaders immediately. So the worst it could get is civil war. I think the best we can express is probably a depression. We're already going into it. As I said last night, you know, what we do, we print money to solve our problems. And all that does is increase debt and creates more freeloaders, social welfare. I'm not against social welfare, but don't print money to pay for. At the same time, our debt escalates. Our debt to GDP right now is 120%. At 90% debt to GDP, we're bankrupt. That means for every dollar we spend, we go deeper in debt right now. So our debt is now in the trillions. I don't know how many trillions it really I've heard it's 260 trillion. I don't know how they measure it anymore. At the same time, they raise interest rates into a recession. This has never been done before. So that's why I'm saying that somebody intentionally doing something to bring America down and the world down. And there's a video of Trump speaking to, I think, the United Nations or something. And he's telling the German contingency back in 2018, he says, don't trust the Russians. Don't depend upon the Russians. And now Russia can cut off their power. So there's something really goofy going on. I'm, I'm not privileged to find out about it. I just want to put some fear into you because the more dangerous the mission, the better you've got to be. I talked about last night how, you know, when I was preparing to go to Vietnam as a Marine helicopter gunship pilot, our life expectancy was 30 days, 30 days. Now, most people said, that's not good. I said, well, it inspired me to become a better pilot. How does a person who has zero influence over the market, no control over interest rates at this phase of their life, how do they properly make the right moves to still be effective where the market's going to go good, bad, or ugly? Stock markets, when they crash, go down in three phases. Boom, boom, boom. Phase one was bounce. It was called a bear market rally. This baby is going down, I hope, because I'm going to get richer. See, the thing right now is if you're afraid, it's because you got bad advice in your head. You're operating on bad information from your mommy, your daddy, your college professor, your school teachers, whatever it is. I get stimulated thinking about a crash because I'll say it again. The tougher it is, the smarter you've got to be. And then it's your skill set. I'll tell you a quick story. When I came back from Vietnam, I said to my rich dad, I said, I want to be an entrepreneur like you. He says, well, you got to take sales lessons, two classes to take real estate courses, which I did. And you have to learn how to sell. I said, I don't want to to sell because my poor dad always says salesmen were scum. That was my poor dad. That's why he's a PhD. Poor, helpless, desperate. He was a great father, but he was a poor man. So finally, I kept arguing with my rich dad. I said, I don't want to learn how to sell. And finally, Rich Dad said to me, he says, you know, I'm 25, 26 years old, prime of life, you know, Marine, all this stuff. He says, how's your life, Robert? 
non-existent. It says, because you can't f***ing sell. <laughs> this time it's different. This is the new economy. We are just coming out of the longest bull run in history, 11 years. Started in 2011. And at 2011, I made the biggest fortunes of my life because that was the MBS mortgage-backed securities and the CDO crashes, the real estate crashed. And I backed up the truck and I borrowed $300 million to buy the best real estate all across the Southwest. This is the largest, longest bull market in history. I look at some of these young kids, you know, and I own some Bitcoin, own some Ethereum, but they're all saying the same thing. This time it's different, you know, and Bitcoin's crashed. And you know, the Federal Reserve Bank I can't believe that. I mean, people say, don't fight the Fed and all this. Well, my question to everybody is this, can the Fed print oil? Can the right. Fed print gas, I mean, gasoline? Can it print food? But everybody sits there and they've been brainwashed by Wall Street to go do as the Fed tells you to do. Well, you gotta be kidding me. Those guys are the three stooges, Janet Yellen, Biden, and Powell. You gotta be kidding me. Why would you listen to them? Volcker saying it's gonna crush so he raised interest rates, right? So Powell is now channeling the spirit of Volcker. And you know, when Volcker crushed inflation, debt to GDP was 30%. And today it's 125% if you believe the numbers. So if he channels Volcker, another thing about history will tell you this, there's never been a soft landing. It's more Fed talk. I've made more money in the last three years in my whole life. And so that's what I'm gonna talk about with you today is that there's other ways of looking at investing, you know, but to think that Powell is going to save you, when as you may know, the reverse repo market is running at two trillion a day today. Right. Two trillion a day, and people are listening to Powell? You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> I own no stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs. I do not touch paper. I'm not saying that you shouldn't, but I say people have been brainwashed by the Fed, the Treasury. Go to school, get a job, pay your taxes, get a high paying job, and invest for the long term in the well-diversified portfolio of stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs. It was in 1974 when I came back from Vietnam, a two-tour Marine helicopter pilot. I saw communism at work. It was not pretty. And I come back in 1974, they passed ERESA. ERESA stands for 401k right now, or IRA. And I went, oh my God, they're funneling my generation, the boomers, into the stock market. And they don't know anything about money. And in 1974, the biggest exodus was school teachers suddenly becoming financial planners. I watched it in horror. That's the poor leading the blind. And today we have baby boomers who are hoping the stock market stays up in their 401k just as social security goes bust. You think that's an accident? That's all I'm saying. I'm just a Marine. I'm a dumbass Marine lieutenant. Flew the gunship, went down three times. But today I listen to this bullshit and I go, oh my God, how can we be that stupid? Because we went to school, we did as we're told, don't fight the Fed, do as the Fed tells you, invest in the long-term, well-diversified portfolio, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs, and don't worry, Powell is now channeling Volcker. When the debt to GDP is at 120%, you gotta be kidding me. So when they were dropping the interest rates, I thought I died and I went to heaven because I buy apartment houses. I own 13,000 apartment houses. Every time the Fed dropped the interest rates, it jacked the value of my properties up, but I also improved the properties and I refinance out. So today I own no money in any of my properties. 13,000 units all throwing cash. They said in a bull market, even idiots feel smart. I'm listening to all these idiots, you know, after 2011, you know, the market crashed in 08 because the repo market went bad. And the repo market is the credit of uh, Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns was bad. So they hammered Bear, and anyway, it's a long story. My friends are all inside that world. But then when it came back out, they just started pumping money. And what they did was they kept printing more money to save a bad economy. It was already crashing again in 2011, but they kept printing money. And today we're gonna pay that price. I use debt because debt is tax-free money. What I did was I rehabbed my apartment, 13,000 of them. I just kept buying more with the cash flow and I'd refinance out as interest rates drop. So I'm in good shape now. Then I took them, then I set all interest rates right now. So I use debt. And who's that guy that says live debt free? Well, that's his opinion. I don't do that. I don't flip houses. Remember all those guys were flipping? So everybody yeah. flipped. No, they were stupid, stupid. When the moment you flip, you have a tax consequence. I never flip, I finance out this tax-free money. Not only that, 
is when I started investing, I had to invest a 12% interest rate. I like debt and I like, I don't pay taxes because every time I borrow more money to float my properties, there's three types of tax breaks. I got appreciation, depreciation, and amortization. So I zero out. So my cost of money is my tax on debt is zero. And I use that to offset tax in my income. When Biden took the Eastern XL pipeline off, my oil I was selling from the ground, which is a tax break also, went from $30 a barrel to $130 a barrel. Today it's like $120. Oh my God, this guy Biden is going to bankrupt us. I'm not saying him, but there's somebody who wants to bankrupt because oil is the lifeblood of civilization. I worked for Standard Oil of California as a tanker officer when I graduated from school. I understand oil. I was on the Alaska pipeline and all this. I'm like, he's screwing us. So when he raises inflation, the poor and middle class will go broke. And that was just done as soon as he, he was being done before he took office. And so I'm looking at this, this guy's gonna sell America down the drain. I'm not saying it's him, but somebody wants us to go broke. And I'm watching this going, oh my God, so what else can I, so I have oil wells. I get tax breaks for those because I don't invest in oil stocks. I work for Standard Oil, but I don't invest in Standard Oil. I invest in the oil on the ground. I'm a wildcatter. Everybody says, don't do it. I don't recommend it, but I like doing it. The gold mines don't do it. I like doing it. There's more opportunity today than ever before, but not if you've been brainwashed into going to school, getting a job, paying taxes, live debt free and invest in the stock market. This bubble right now is a bigger bubble than 2008. This is the everything bubble. You know, it's going to be not only stocks, bonds, but also credit. I mean, but it's more opportunity is going to come out of it. And that's what I'm saying. Be careful who you listen to because your best asset, but also your biggest liability are the ideas in your head and be careful who puts them there. The Central Bank of the United States was founded in 1913. Guess what else was founded in 1913? Tax uh, department. Yeah. And so when you look at all this and then you can read Marx, he says that a progressive income tax is necessary for the spread of communism. And then when they cut off the Keystone XL pipeline, inflation went through the roof. Now the poor are already poor. But when you raise inflation, price of fuel, the middle class got poor. And now when I shop, I look around and I go to the retailers. Everything's on sale. I can't help myself. But I feel for the retailers right now because the customers are going broke. So it, is the intent evil? I suspected it was going to get bad. You know, most of my books, I cannot say what I want to say. I said this, this we're going to crash big time. Yeah. It was in 2008, damn right it crashed. And we're still crashing today. Dalio says we're now in a depression. So that's why I speak what I said. And so at Freedom Fest, even I got censored there. So what's happening to America? So we're here with uh, Mark Moss. I mean, he did a report on this guy named Klaus Schwab, which I've only heard rumors about. So that's why this program is a very important show to find out what's going on. Since 1971, what's happened with income inequality, the obesity rate, the incarceration rate, the divorce rate, the you know, medium income, debt levels, everything since 1971. Why since 1971? It's the year we got off the gold standard. So you could just, it's a hundred charts that show what a WTF happened in 1971. <laughs> and the, you can see it, it's just like crazy. Okay, and the it. reason why I start with the F is because when was the World Economic Forum founded? The whole world went off the rails in 1971. When you distort the money, you get all types of distortion. And one of those is seen at the WEF. It was in 1972, I realized what had happened. Mm -hmm. I was flying in Vietnam. And that's when I went on the gold standard. And I bought my first little Krugeran in uh, Hong Kong for about 50 bucks. A lot of people might have heard of something like Davos, where every year the world leader, a lot of people call them the world elite. I don't like to use that word. They're not elite in anything. None of us would hire them in our business, but the world leader, the, the policy makers, if you will, the think tankers, they get together every year in Davos. And so you hear like the Davos man uh, in reference or something. What their policy is, is this uh, public private partnership. It's okay. politicians okay. and business people getting together, public and private, getting together to set policy. They get together every year in Davos, Switzerland at the World Economic Forum. And so it was founded by this guy, Klaus Schwab. He's created this think tank, bringing these people together to try to figure out a better way, a more equitable way to run the world. Watch out. Anytime you see that word equitable, you know what they're talking about. They're talking about Marxism. And so what really what he's done is he's just taken the same ideas. You said we haven't seen this before, but of course we have. It's the same ideas being rehashed. And so it's just Marxism all over. So they get the world leaders together, the politicians, the public and the private, and they come together in what he's calling stakeholder capitalism. 
stakeholder capitalism. So instead of, uh, we talked about last night at dinner, how Rothbard said that businesses should focus on profit. He says, no, no, business shouldn't focus on profit. Business should focus on the community, ESG, environmental, social governance. We should be equitable. And so um, basically distorted all these things, but they want to do it through power through control, forcing people to comply instead of educating people and showing people better ways. And so they've done it through the public-private partnership. So basically through the money. So now if you don't fall in line with what their policies are, no money for you, no investment for you, right? And if these big companies don't follow along with their policies and push these things down, they don't get the funding and then they basically get pushed out. And so for the last 12 years, I've studied the macro. I learned a concept called uh, wealth transfers. Money doesn't disappear, it transfers. And so when I lost my wealth, somebody else got that. I didn't like that. That's a very good point. <laughs> and it's happening today. And so I realized there's certain times and conditions where these wealth transfers happen. And so I've spent the last 12 years studying these wealth transfers to figure out how do I get on the receiving end instead of being on the receiving end of those things. I reference quite often what Henry Kissinger said, a warning to the world, but I think it was more of a call to arms on their side. So he said, if you control the food, you control the people. If you control the energy, you control the continent. If you control the money, you control the world. Let's back up. A lot of people don't know who Kissinger was. Oh, he's still around. He's, he's Secretary of State, right? For Nixon. Yeah. You he know, opened the door to China. Yeah, but also yeah. instrumental throughout Europe as well during that time of the, you know, coming out of the World War II, kind of redrawing the world and setting peace and stuff like that. Um, so he was very influential and he still is today. Like, what are the attack vectors today? So food, <laughs> we're running out of food. The, per the UN, I think it's 868 million people could starve to death in the next 24 months. Well, you look at what's happening in Sri Lanka today. Yeah. You know, there's rioting going on and all this because it's corruption. I and mean, yeah. basic corruption is what it is, but they're starving. Yeah, they're starving. And the Ukraine is going to starve a lot of people. They're starving and they have no energy. So <laughs> Sri Lanka had the best ESG score in the world, 90 out of 100. <laughs> they had put out an article two years ago said that by 2025, they were going to be one of the richest nations. They were going to be the poster child for ESG, uh, how environmentally sound you, low impact <sighs> on the environment your social score, and then your governance. Do you have diversity on your board and all of these things? They were gonna be the poster child. They proclaimed that we will be the best by 2025, they said. By 2025, we'll be one of the richest nations in the world based off of this sustainability. This I'm in a part of the seams right now. They're completely gone. They defaulted on their bonds. They got no money. Nobody will loan them any more money. They don't have any money to import any energy, so they have no energy, and they're gone. It's important to understand, too, like where we're at in the world, right, where it's this peak centralization, central planning. Right. I like to say central planning always fails and uh, because they don't have enough data. They know they don't have enough data. You can't organize billions of people, right, but they're trying to. And so central planning, so it's World Economic Forum, World Health Organization, World Trade Organization. Fauci, Fauci. Yeah. World Meteorological Association. And then, yeah, the UN, the IMF, the BIS. Bank of International Settlements. But nobody knows what the BIS is. Right. And the it's BIS. The central Bank, Central Bank. The central bank of central banks, exactly. The way I see the world, on the org chart, the BIS sits at the top. Below the BIS, then you have some of these think tanks, so the World Economic Forum, the Club of Rome, and so they're the policy makers, and then they push it down to the next row in the org chart to the policy enforcers, which are the governments. And so the governments sit a few levels down, so it's really a coup of the bankers, and they use this banker, the BIS at the top, to push these ideas through the think tanks and then down to the polling forces. And then we're down at the bottom of the subjects of all that, right? So Klaus is kind of running this. Um, he's sitting on top of the world, hobnobbing with all these people, flying their private jets over to Davos, telling us that we need to cut back on our energy. I'm telling us that we need to eat the bugs. This is on their website. They're talking about why we should be eating bugs or more sustainable. Yeah, like Nicole Kidman, she made a commercial, I think two weeks ago, of her actually eating bugs. That's what they're putting on TV now. The food is the first attack vector. So I was on Fox Business two weeks ago. They asked me about an article the UN put out when the UN titled the article, why it's good to be hungry, why being hungry is good. And they were saying we need people to be starving because there's all these jobs that have to be done that nobody would do unless they were starving. Who said that? It was an article on the UN website. Wow. Like I said, Fox had me on to talk about it. They took it down after half a day because the backlash was so insane. But per the UN, about 860 million people could starve to death in the next 24 months, almost a billion. So Marxism, whenever Marxism has been tried in Russia in the early 1900s, about 25 million people starved to death. In Mao's Great Leap Forward, about 50 million people starved to death. Those were horrific, 50 million people. And they killed them too. We're talking about almost a billion now. And so at a time when we have almost a billion people that could be starving to death, shouldn't we be trying to get as much food as possible out? We would try to do everything we can. But in Holland, they've gone and shut down the farms they're trying to take over their land and they want to take over the farms and stop them from growing not just food, but also raising cattle and meat. It's massive protests are happening in Holland at a time where we need more food. In the United States, 
the farmers are being paid not to plant. They're not allowed to plant on some of their land. And they went and they petitioned the Secretary of Agriculture and said, hey, let us plant. We can get more food. And they said, no, it's not in line with our agreement for the Paris Accord. Environmental thing. Which is the environmental thing, which is what President Trump had pulled us out of. And then Biden's very first day in office, the most important thing he had to do by executive order was put us back into the Paris Accord. So we can't grow food in the United States because of, you know, climate change. Holland can't grow food. And now the protests are happening all over the world. And it's even bigger. So like all throughout Europe, there's an energy crisis going on. Everybody should know that by now. And they don't have natural gas. They're dependent on Russia for natural gas. But we need natural gas in Europe to make fertilizer. And we need fertilizer to grow food. We also need natural gas to process food. What are the three things that Kitchen Service said? Yeah, so food. Points. And then the next one is the energy. And the next one is? And then the money. Right. And that's what Rekers is talking about. CBDC, yeah. Central Bank Digital Currents. For the greater good. I mean, Putin's saying that Americans must sacrifice and must suffer because we have to defeat Russia. It's for the greater good. But the Achilles heel is that third one, which is the money the supply. Money. And that's the big one. In the Communist Manifesto, he had 10 points. Number five was the creation of a central bank. Right. So central banks are part of Marxism. Of course. That's the whole goal. Yeah. <laughs> the central bank is communism, mm -hmm. central controlled economy. American system, well, not, not Americans, but most people are completely uninformed. When communism was defeated in the 70s and really started in about the 60s, it kind of went underground and it came into the universities in the United States. And so they've done a really good job playing this long game and they started with changing the college age kids' viewpoints on these things who have now moved into media, who have now moved into government, who have and now moved into finance. And this has gone back, this goes back to what, the 60s? The 60s, yeah. yeah. Because in the 60s, I remember Columbia first time rioting. I'm going, why are they rioting? You know what I mean? But it was in the 60s. Mm -hmm. It was against the Vietnam War. And then when I came back from Vietnam, I got hit with eggs and spit on and called baby killer. It was college kids. It's not improved. Now we have TikTok. And TikTok is scrambling. It's turning their brains into scrambled eggs. It is. It's bad. And it's a Chinese organization. The one thing that we have to our advantage is their ideas don't work. Left to their own, they fit. That, that's a very good point. So Nietzsche says, that which is falling, shall ye also push. So it's already fallen. The system's crumbling. The financial system is done. Like the EU's on the verge of breaking up. The bond problem that they have is one that they probably can't solve over there. The pigs nations down below, they're done. Germany has lost its position. The energy is too high. So the EU's on the verge of breaking up. Who are the pigs? Uh, the Portugal, Italy, Greece, Spain. So the southern nations in the European Union. You know, Italy and Greece have to constantly be bailed out. They don't have any production. Germany has been the production engine of Europe, but now they've become a net importer because of the, the energy prices have gone so high that they can't afford to produce anymore and they have to import their energy. But why do they have to import their energy? Well, they shut all their nuclear reactors off. Well, over the last decade, they've been shutting them down. And so their energy prices have gone up by eight times when next door France, they still have cheap power because they still have nuclear. So in Europe, they have massive amounts of shale gas like we do in the United States, but they don't want to get it out. Humans can take a lot of abuse from governments, but when you can't eat or feed your family, that's when it's like game on, right? And nine meals to anarchy, they say. You don't eat for nine <laughs> meals, it's on, right? Well, three for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what they've been doing is they've been taking to the streets, sort of like we saw in Canada with the truckers, but now it's the farmers with their tractors. And they're taking these tractors and they're making the Canadian truckers look like child play. I mean, they are out in serious droves. Some of the farmers got arrested. The farmers went to the police station, surrounded them and made them release the farmers. They They've been filling up the city with manure. They blocked the airports. The fishermen have gotten involved. Now the fishermen are blocking the ports. I even saw the farmers broke into the military base and started dragging jets out of the military and putting them on the roads to block. <laughs> Good for them. But now it's spread to Poland. It's spread to Germany. That's All the farmers are uniting in protest. So it's backing up. It's like the drain got clogged and now it's backing up on Klaus Schwab and buddies. Yeah. yeah. And so now they're like, well, if we can't grow food, then no food. So you get no food then. And uh, the shelves are bare. I personally believe we're at a war right now. Without the freedom of payments, without freedom of money, there is no freedom at all. So we're guaranteed a freedom of speech, but if I don't have money to buy a phone or go on the internet or print a pamphlet or build a website, I have no freedom of speech. And if I have freedom of assembly, but I can't pay to put gas in my truck to drive to the assembly, I have no freedom of assembly either. It means what it sounds like, so you'll own nothing to be happy. So what they think, what Marxism thinks is that um, if we could take away your private property, you could just have everything, like live in a commune, like communism, and we could take away human desire to strive and to have more, because that's what poisons us. This capitalist system that makes me want to work and achieve more and Which have more Which is human order. nature. Right, human nature. If we can take that away, people would be happy. 
because right now we're unhappy because we don't have what we want. We're always striving. We always have to work harder. And so if we could take that away, <laughs> but that's what they think. So you'll own nothing and you'll be happy because you won't need to strive. You won't see anybody else having something that you don't have. And they think there's this utopia, but they don't understand that it's human nature to your point. I'm asking you, is it intent or is it a mistake? The real struggle, the real axis of struggle is between the individual and the collectivist. It keeps trying to pull them into these groups and take away their individual identity. Command and control, this is communism. It's called free market capitalism, but more important is we're fighting for our freedoms. Like, I'm afraid to speak up now. You remember during COVID, they were censoring doctors, you couldn't say anything. It's tragic what's happening. Yeah. So we fight for our freedoms more than anything else, not for capitalism. You want to be a Marxist? Be a Marxist. You want to be a tranny? Have a good life. Who you sleep with? None of my business. But don't take my freedom away.